My name is Florence, I'm a commercial archaeologist with a small unit in London called Compass Archaeology. So the first obvious thing to start with is, what do I mean by British exceptionalism? So exceptionalism is a concept that can kind of be boiled down to the idea that something is unique and or special. So if we're talking about British exceptionalism, that's the idea that Britain is unique or special. And kind of linking in with what Kevin was saying earlier, actually, um, in the kind of print and online media, these kind of narratives have had particular prominence in the lead up to the referendum and afterwards. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of that. First, this uh, front page from The Sun from June 14th. Um, not very subtle uh, symbolism there. And I picked out a couple of points from the accompanying text. Um, in particular, our country has a glorious history. Um, but this statement had no kind of context within the text. It was just put out there. Um, then um, another example, uh, this from uh, the Labour MP, Gisela Stewart, who is actually the chair of the Leave campaign. Um, and she said in an interview, a lot of continental yeah. countries stuck for a very long time with this nationality principle based on bloodlines. But in contrast, for 300 years, these Isles had a supranational identity, being British. Um, I just found that kind of strange that she was kind of drawing on this idea of a constructed identity through bloodlines, but also this idea that there was a consistent identity in the British Isles for 300 years. And then another example, this is from a piece that Michael Gove wrote back all the way in February, um, in which he was kind of trying to draw on examples of um, British historical achievements uh, for why we should leave the EU. And in particular, I've highlighted, we established trial by jury in the modern world and we led the world in abolishing slavery, um, because thematically, I'm gonna link back to these examples later. Um, and, just for fun, I thought I'd include uh, when Theresa May earlier this month said that we should have a red, white and blue Brexit, which much like the statement of Brexit is Brexit is essentially meaningless. Um, in his book, Facts of Subversive, Political Writing from a Decade Without a Name, T Timothy Garton Ash referenced Gordon Marshall on how the British school child experiences a yo sushi approach to historical instruction, you know, sushi being the restaurant with the bits of sushi that come on the conveyor belt. Um, and this analogy basically meaning that you kind of get tidbits of history. And I think that's quite relevant to these narratives of British exceptionalism, where you're just kind of taking various examples, but it's very ahistorical, there's no kind of context. But what about archaeology? What kind of place has that had in these narratives? Or how has the media in this country portrayed archaeology recently? So, in reaction to the Historic England report on national infrastructure development capacity, in which it was stated that the number of people employed in commercial archaeology will need to grow by a minimum of 25% over the next six years to meet the demand of large infrastructure works. Um, we had these headlines in the press, uh, Time Teams, a lack of archaeologists threatens the progress of vital infrastructure projects in the Times. Uh, a lack of archaeologists will bring UK to a halt, <laughs> from my news. And HS2 and home building schemes at risk of delay because Britain is running out of archaeologists to examine relics dug up during construction. Uh, that's my personal favourite. <laughs> um, so, generally, archaeology has been portrayed as this obstacle to progress. To be fair, in the Daily Mail article, they do reference some examples of archaeological finds, but in this case, it's, you know, they're referencing an <coughs> exceptional Roman sculpture. They, they only want to reference the most exceptional examples. Um, so, generally, archaeology just doesn't fit into the bigger picture. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into this in more detail, but um, with the announcement of the Neighbourhood Planning and Infrastructure Bill in May, and the scrapping of the archaeology A-level, there's kind of this sense that archaeology in general is being deprioritised. Um, it's not playing a part in this book of exceptionalism, except as a footnote. So I would, I would argue that it can play a part in that book by burning it. Uh, so I want to give two case studies from work that I've done as a commercial, archaeolog commercial archaeologist of Compass Archaeology. Um, and I just want to state that 
by just choosing two examples, I know that in a way that means I'm also guilty of that Yosushi approach by just picking. But unfortunately, the brevity of this dictates that. And also, I want to challenge this single story of British exceptionalism by looking at two examples which I think can relate to dark heritage. Now, dark heritage is quite difficult to define, um, but generally, broadly, it's been used to refer to sites linked to death and destruction, for example. Um, in terms of the examples I'm presenting, I want to emphasise their potentially troubling nature due to their association with practices in the past which caused human suffering and which we wouldn't really find morally acceptable now. So this is my first example, Northampton Prison. Um, I think this is particularly relevant now because we've recently had a few riots in prisons in the UK. Um, so back in February of this year, I undertook a desk-based assessment of Northampton Prison, Northampton being in North Yorkshire, in which I was looking at the archaeological potential of this site um, before it was going to be redeveloped. Northampton Prison was built on a swampy wasteland, uh, which the locals dumped their rubbish. Uh, this is a plan of that wasteland back from 1784, which was attached to the title deeds. Um, and then the prison was completed in 1788 and altered numerous times. This is a plan of the prison as it was in 1870, almost 100 years later, um, including a giant treadmill. Um, this was used by prisoners to grind corn. It was originally built in 1821, and at that time, it was apparently the biggest treadmill in the world. I mean, that is truly exceptional, but not in a way that we'd be proud of. Um, <laughs> Captain George Gardner, he was the governor of the prison from 1862 to 88, and he established photography in the prison, and that's very important for what I'm next going to show you. This is a photograph of an 11-year-old girl called Sophia Constable, photographed in 1872. She was in prison with hard labour for three weeks and then had four years in a reformatory for stealing a loaf of bread. Luckily for her, that tremor was replaced in 1863, but it was then replaced with hand mills, which she would have had to use. Uh, I found this photograph on a website called My Learning, which provides educational resources. And she was also in an exhibition put together by young offenders in the prison in 2008. Um, this photograph has stayed with me ever since I first saw it back in February. And for me, it kind of, it's this stark reminder that the story of Britain has not been one of kind of punitive exceptionalism in any way that we want to be proud of. Um, at the same time, it's important to be reflexive. I mean, I deliberately chose this photograph because I knew it'd be very emotive. Um, I could have, for example, talked about the prison riots there in 1946. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to do that. Um, even though we were only seeing her through this kind of bureaucratic lens of the prison at the time, I'm still kind of glad that I could show that because when I was first researching this prison, of course, the first things I came across were, say, the architects who designed the prison and the prison governors. But by showing her photograph, by looking more into her, I've got a different perspective on the prison. So my second example is an object, uh, an artifact. Um, but first, I want to give it some more context. Um, so this is the White Hart pub in Southall. Um, uh, Compass Archaeology undertook an evaluation there earlier this year. Um, a public house existed on the site since 1660, when it was first mentioned, and it was a coaching inn on the London to Oxford Road. And this is a view of it uh, from 1930. In 1934, the inn was demolished and single structure set back from the road, and in 2009 to 10, it was cleared for redevelopment. Four, eva four evaluation trenches were dug on the site. And the object I'm going to show you was from Trench 4. Um, these plans so that show the trenches in relation to the 19th century inn and the 1934 White Hart Pub. Um, in Trench 4, we had masonry structures from both phases. And the earlier White Hart Inn was represented by a collection of walls and footings in the southern half and the northeast corner of the trench. And then we've got wall 419, which formed the southern wall of the room, and it was tiled on its northern face. And the feature was interpreted as a possible urinal. And uh, material 420 was depo deposited south of 419. And the object I'm about to show you came out of this. 
So this is a clay tobacco pipe. It has the moulded decoration of a kneeling slave on it. Here's a kind of a closer look. And um, a figure is naked to the waist, kneeling on the left leg with his hands bound by chains. The chains are quite faint, you can just see them there. Um, and I found kind of a comparative piece in the British Museum online collection. Um, so this is, oh, sorry, um, and on the other side there was the figure of liberty. Um, this anti-slavery motif actually came from Wedgwood medallions, which were produced in the late 18th century in support for the abolition of the slave trade, or they were commemorative of the abolition post-1807. And um, comparing the piece that we found with the British Museum one, it probably dates to 1810 to 50. Um, just a couple of points I want to make about this. It's kind of deeply ironic that an anti-slavery motif is on a tobacco pipe, given that tobacco was imported from American slave plantations. And actually, a lot of abolitionists themselves imported such products even after, after 1807. Um, and it's also interesting, this is kind of a very ephemeral item, um, apparently influenced by what Wed the Wedgwood Museum says was the earliest fashion item to support a cause. And the pipe was found in the borough of Ealing, but the production centres for this design were apparently in Hull, Gainsborough, Lincoln and Norwich, so in the East Midlands. So this shows there was a demand for anti-slavery pipes outside of that area, or perhaps it reflects that someone was just passing through the inn. So to conclude, uh, how and why should commercial archaeology challenge British, British exceptionalism? Well, I think the two examples that I've shown kind of challenged Gove's simplistic um, account earlier of we established trial by during the modern world and we led the world in abolishing slavery. Um, both of these examples relate to Britain's changing attitudes towards human rights and dignity. It's true that we may no longer allow child labour and treadmills in our prisons, but as the recent riots have shown, we're failing to provide safe and reformative prisons now. We may no longer import tobacco from slave plantations in America, but just as an example, you can buy clothes on the high street that was made in sweatshops. But openly showing a past that was not just a glorious rush to perfect democracy, freedom, and tolerance, we create a context for critique in the present itself, which is why I think it's so important to challenge these narratives of British exceptionalism. And just a couple of thoughts to end with. I'm glad one of my examples came from outside of London. A lot of development happens within urban centres, but that's not solely the case. And also, um, commercial archaeology has so much, so much rich data to draw upon, but... Um, as Kevin was saying earlier, we can, we can do better. Um, the Landwood Research Profiling Profession report from 2012 to 13 uh, states that 99% um, of working archeologists identified as white and 98% did not identify as disabled. So yeah, we've got all this brilliant data to draw upon. We can critique these kind of simplistic narratives but we can also do a lot better as a profession. Um, got my references here and some acknowledgements and that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.